Hello everyone, I'm Vasvi Singh. I'm a multimodality imaging cardiologist and director of the cardiac amyloidosis program at Midwest Heart and Vascular Specialist, HCA Midwest Health in Kansas City. As chairperson of the ASNEX Fellow and Training Committee, I would like to welcome you all to our inaugural webinar of a webinar series focused on fellows and training and early career physicians organized by the FIT committee. Today's session would explore the journey of our advanced faculty on how they became an expert in the field of nuclear cardiology, both research and clinical perspectives. We would also be introduced to the various opportunities that ASNEC offers to FITS and ECPs with a focus on the leadership development program. In addition, we will also go over specific programs and networking opportunities at the annual scientific meeting coming up in September for this special group. Please enter your questions as they arise in the chat box and our speakers will address them during the question and answer sessions. My amazing co-moderators today, also members of the FIT committee, Amranali and Michael. Dr. Mirali Shetty is completing her cardiology fellowship at North Shore University uh, Health, uh, Health System at Illinois and is going to go on to be an advanced cardiac imaging fellow at Columbia University. Dr. Michael Osborne is a cardiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, and specializes in advanced cardiac imaging. They are both esteemed participants of ASNEC's leadership development program with me. I would also like to really thank our virtual moderator, Dr. Shadhan Kalaf, who is an assistant professor of cardiology and a multimodality CV imager at MD Anderson. So to start today's session, I would like to invite ASNEC's current president, Dr. Dennis Kalman. He's the Director of Nuclear Imaging at Ohio Health Heart and Vascular Physicians, Riverside Methodist Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kalman. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much, Vasvi, and thank you, Marin and Michael and Chelsea for organizing this program. And welcome to all of you who are attending. I'm so glad that you took a little bit of time to be with us, and we're hoping uh, to get you enthusiastic about um, nuclear cardiology the importance of ASNIC's early career members uh, are because the success of ASNIC and the field of nuclear cardiology literally depends on you. Um, we need our younger early career members to uh, have enthusiasm and to advance the field and uh, take over leadership positions uh, of the ASNIC society in the future. So we literally depend on you. And that's why ASNIC really uh, pays a lot of attention to the needs of our earlier career members and our fellows in training, as you'll find out uh, this evening. Um, the other reason is because we practice in a multimodality imaging environment, so we know that there's a lot of competition for interest in, in other imaging modalities, and we need to uh, encourage people to really have a special interest and a desire to become leaders in the field of nuclear cardiology to ensure the success of the field in the future. And we know that early career members have different needs for communication and education than some of our uh, members who are uh, later in their uh, careers. And so we know that we need to adapt to your needs. One of the things that ASNIC does um, routinely is uh, surveys our membership to determine what their needs are for educational topics. And as you can see on this slide that the fellows in training and early career people have different priorities in terms of educational topics. These uh, types of surveys are updated uh, frequently so that we can tailor our educational programs to meet the needs of our younger um, uh, colleagues and really get them on the right track going forward. Um, you're gonna hear more tonight about the ASNIC Leadership Development Program that is uh, under the directorship of uh, Dr. Larry Phillips, who will be speaking to you tonight. And uh, this has been referred to as the best idea that ASNIC has ever had. And I really believe that to be true. ASNIC came up with this idea many years ago. I wish I could take credit for it, but it was others who came up with the idea. But other societies uh, are following the lead of ASNIC and developing leadership development programs of their own. And I think it's an excellent thing. And as you see, uh, Vasvi, Marin, and Michael are all members of the leadership development program. And uh, that's really very helpful for ensuring the success of the society. Since this is my opportunity to talk to you, I thought it'd be uh, a good idea to briefly give you my background. Um, oh, these are <laughs> strange. I'll, sorry for the multiple clips. Um, I have an engineering degree um, from Penn State as an undergrad, and then I went to medical school at Penn State. 
I did my internal medicine residency at University of Michigan and then my cardiology fellowship and an extra year of nuclear cardiology research fellowship at the University of Virginia. And since then, I've been a multimodality imager at Riverside Methodist Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, there, I share uh, my imaging responsibilities with our imaging team. And just based on the volume of studies that are performed, I spend probably 80% of my time doing echocardiography and stress echo and TE, uh, about maybe 15% of my time doing nuclear cardiology uh, imaging interpretations, and about 5% doing cardiac CT. And again, that's not because of the way we divide the responsibilities, it's just based on the volume at our center. Um, personally, I don't enjoy doing three-hour TEs wearing lead for structural heart cases. Uh, some of my partners do enjoy that, some of you may enjoy that. I don't really enjoy that. I do like doing uh, cardiac uh, CT. I love nuclear cardiology and I really love cardiac PET. So that's kind of my uh, background. And with that, I will end and move to the next speaker. And again, thank you so much for all of you for attending. Thank you, Dr. Kalman, for highlighting the importance of ASNIC's early career members and sharing your personal background and journey with us. Our next speaker is Dr. Sharmila Dorbala, who is the Director of Nuclear Cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School, Boston, Massachusetts. She's a personal mentor for me from whom I have learned and continue to learn immensely. She will be discussing her journey to nuclear cardiology, a research perspective. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Dorbala. I You're think on you muted, Sharmila. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vasvi. Uh, thanks to all of you for organizing this uh, really great um, meeting and webinar. So what I want to do is uh, share with you some of my personal journey and perspective, uh, just to put things in context. And let's see, all right, these are my disclosures. So when I talk about, uh, when I think about my journey to nuclear cardiology, I think of the various hats that I have worn uh, over the last 20 years of my career. So I started off with internal medicine, then did my cardiology training. I did echo and nuclear at that time, then started off as a faculty member at Brigham Women. So all of this um, initial part was at St. Luke's Roosevelt in New York. Then I moved to Boston as a faculty member. Here I uh, learned cardiac PET. I started the cardiac CT program at the Brigham and Women's along with Frankie Ribicki. Got engaged in really educating served as the first program director for one of the uh, very important cardiovascular imaging fellowship training programs in this country. Uh, then serve as a mentor, got into research, doing some research, working uh, in amyloidosis, now getting a little bit into pediatric imaging. So you can look at all the various different portfolios that I've covered. And at every step of the way, there was a bifurcation point for me to decide whether I want to do this or not. And I'll share with you probably some anecdotes about how this happened. Some of it was chance, some of it was a deliberate decision, uh, but either way, I think I have learned from each of these experiences. And that's one thing I wanted to share with you. Whatever your path may be, whatever you've done, it really doesn't matter. It's what matters ultimately is how you have enjoyed this, and how that helps you overall. So the first uh, pathway is how did I get into nuclear cardiology and uh, into cardiology? So after internal medicine, I knew I wanted to be a cardiologist. And then the nuclear cardiology piece was really chance. So this was driven by the fact that I had a small child. He was only two months old when I was about to start my cardiology fellowship. So when I heard my match results and I knew I matched into cardiology at that time, the call was in-house and it was overnight. So if I left Friday morning, I got home on Monday evening. And with this two month old baby, I just could not imagine um, that uh, challenge for both me and for my spouse, my husband. So I decided to take a gap year and push behind my cardiology training by one year. And that gap year ended up as nuclear cardiology. So I had two options even at that time. I could go into clinical trials with a shock study with Dr. Judy Hockman, or I could go into nuclear cardiology with Alan Rosansky and Gordon DePuy, and I chose nuclear cardiology. 
So think of where I started, how I ended up with nuclear. This is really chance, but this is what is my primary career at this point, and this is what I enjoy uh, doing. So one piece that uh, resonated with me all along was really you need to have harmony. You need to have some kind of work-life balance in order to really enjoy what you're doing, whether it's at work or at home, maintain that harmony, make decisions that really make sense both at work uh, and in life in general, don't hesitate to get help at home. So this is one thing I've done all along, which is delegated a lot of domestic uh, tasks and chores, got help uh, without a question. And it's not just help at home, but even at work, the things that you could delegate, you can help. I think that's one uh, thing I wanted to say. Then once I finished my training, how did I choose my first faculty position? Again, considered many options. I had several opportunities like most of you do, uh, thinking of, you know, where would I succeed? Where do I fit? What is the future? What do I want to do? Again, everything depends on the balance. Uh, basically, the decision I made at that point was to come to Boston to join as faculty member in the radiology department at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And in this role, I got to practice nuclear cardiology clinically, got to build the nuclear cardiology program along with Marcelo Di Carli, uh, built uh, the cardiac PET program under his guidance and uh, built the cardiac CT program along with Frankie Ribicki. Got involved in education, both uh, fellows, residents, students, then subsequently got involved in research. So my initial role was primarily clinical and education. Once we took care of that, then I got into research. I think the most important uh, part for me in this whole thing was this stepwise approach gave me an opportunity to really strive for excellence. I could do a lot of clinical work, fine tune my clinical skills that I learned as a fellow. I could do a lot about education, understand a lot about education, then finally get into research. This may not be the path for everyone. Um, people know they want to go into research, even when they are trainees, they may want to go straight into a research career. But my pathway was a clinical uh, practice career uh, at an academic institution with education that eventually moved into research. So one thing I've learned over the last 20 years is don't hesitate to learn and develop new skills. So again, coming back to the story, I had no fellowship training in cardiac PET and coronary CT had index uh, exist when I was uh, uh, a fellow, a calcium score existed, but not CT coronary angiography as we know it. So I learned these new things and that's very, very uh, helpful. When I got into research, the initial studies I did uh, were based on uh, you know, retrospective data, really the data from our lab, clinical experience, then eventually went into multi-site collaborative studies with large uh, PET registry from multiple sites together. So this has uh, really been extremely helpful for me because I had no research background when I started um, as a resident and as a fellow. And uh, under Dr. Judy Hawkman's guidance at, um, at St. Luke's, I knew how research was done. I recruited participants for research studies, but only when I became a faculty, I had an opportunity to really um, look at research studies, write papers and understand statistics and all of those things. So this was extremely helpful to lay the ground for me. So now the question is, when did I branch off into research? So this branch, I had to think a lot. There was a lot of deliberation, a lot of discussions with um, several people. And one of the things was I had to plan to develop expertise in research. Started off with retrospective observational projects, really worked on a lot on uh, Marcelo Di Carli's projects at that point, then figured out you know, how to develop an independent research trajectory trying to think of how to initiate a new line of investigation. And at this point started mentoring trainees. And now I'm at a stage where I'm within the area, I'm able to look for new areas of research and trying to make uh, these primary pathways for my mentees, working with collaborators in different areas. So anyway, the goal at this point, once I made the decision to go into the research pathway was to really develop a portfolio of research, which is funded. So discussed with the department, with mentors, including peer mentors, and of course, family, very, very important. A good mentor can be extremely helpful at this stage because uh, a mentor can guide you to do one thing or the other, and this could be extremely important for your future career. 
So how did I choose what I wanted to do? Again, several of our fellows here at the Brigham already know what they want to do based on their undergrad experience and their fellowship experience. Here I was a faculty member with no previous research experience, did the observational research. So I was fully open. I was fully open to take on any new research um, interest. So basically tried to figure out what makes sense. We had an amyloidosis center of excellence. We had a cardiovascular imaging center of excellence. Therefore, it only made sense to develop molecular imaging of amyloidosis. So this is one way um, I did it. And as I said, there are uh, folks that I work with here who already know uh, through their undergrad experience exactly what they want to do. So both opportunities, uh, both options exist. What are the topics for research? Again, you know, we could look at amyloidosis as a disease, look at basic science research, clinical work, cost effectiveness, epidemiology, any of these. And I think the challenge in the decision making is how do you get into this? Part of it is what's your knowledge base? What's, who are your collaborators? What is your uh, existing um, available resources? So basically, I ended up focusing on the disease process rather than focusing on um, a technique at this point. And again, I cannot emphasize how important it is to collaborate uh, in all these areas for research. So the next option, what are your funding options? So the funding options could be the governmental funding, NIH, industry, or foundation. And again, I want to tell all of you, please uh, get grant writing help. Grant writing is very important. You may have great ideas, but if you don't put it properly together into a proper grant, it won't get funded. And this is a, a breakdown that someone uh, told me once uh, that about a 30% split would be really a good portfolio to have. Take advantage of earlier, early career grants, foundation grants from ASNIC, INC, ISA, career development awards from HA and NIH. Key point, persevere, do not give up. So the first attempt, you don't get it, that's okay. Just go ahead and reapply, make sure you um, get funded. So once I went into this pathway, then I had some more um, dedicated papers, research related to amyloidosis, new traces in amyloidosis, looking at uh, autoradiography studies and others. Then taking advantage of research educational offerings. I benefited a lot from getting an MPH in clinical effectiveness from the School of Public Health. I attended a lot of HA research career development seminars and uh, meetings, also did some uh, classes and courses at the business school. Take advantage of all of those if you have the option. Clinically, stay current on your knowledge, learn everything. Research-wise, stay current on your knowledge again, identify gaps and try to fill those gaps. Most important for a funded research portfolio is to really focus, focus and try to address the gaps in a specific area. So basically focusing on amyloidosis as a disease process gave me the opportunity to expand into various areas within uh, amyloidosis. Pilot grants were very important for me, both from ASNIC and Amyloidosis Foundation. And eventually I also got a career development grant from the NIH. This uh, resulted in more independent funding from the NIH and multiple other grants from the HA as well as a number of uh, industry grants as well. So of course, big thanks to the entire research team, my co-PIs, my co-investigators uh, in this particular journey, my current research team, and of course, all the former research teams of which Dr. Vasvi Singh is a very critical part. And finally, Dr. Marcelo Di Carli, who's been a mentor to me and is a co-investigator on the MICA team as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorbala, for sharing with us your amazing personal and professional journey, how to make the best use of opportunities, and then how to find best a harmonious balance. Our next speaker is Dr. Lawrence Phillips, who is Associate Professor at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, Director of the Nuclear Cardiology Lab and Associate Director of the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship Program for NYU Langone Health. He is currently serving as Chair of ASNIC's Leadership Development Program. And through that, he has made several opportunities and unparalleled experiences available to all of its participants. He will be discussing his journey to nuclear cardiology from a clinical perspective and how to get involved with ASNIC's leadership development program. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Phillips. Great, thank you so much. And um, wow, 
Sharmila, that was amazing. I, I was taking notes myself of, of everything that you did. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm gonna to speak on the clinical perspective, um, including both my training and also I think what ASNIC has to offer in enhancing training. Um, I wanna start with uh, two numbers. 75% and 1,369,821. And I won't ask people if they know what these numbers mean. Uh, but related to this, the 75% represents the number of cardiology fellows, the percent who take the, the nuclear cardiology boards. And this reminds me that a lot of what we focus in ASDIC is on the folks that have a dedicated um, experience with nuclear cardiology, but almost three quarters of the, the cardiology fellows are taking the nuclear cardiology boards. This uh, 1 million plus number is the number of Medicare paid studies in 2020 uh, for SPECT. And when I look at these numbers, I realize the vast clinical experience of nuclear cardiology that takes place in society and how we have to make sure that our education and our experience uh, and our expertise continues in what we do today and also what we do tomorrow with our colleagues. So, so my training for cardiology was from 2005 to 2008. I was at North Shore University Hospital in Long Island Jewish in New York, now Northwell Health System. Um, it was a very heavy clinical program. We had two sites, uh, one with two dedicated nuclear cardiology SPECT cameras, one with the other with a, it's a single um, dedicated nuclear cardiology camera. It was a SPECT site, tremendous referral volume. Uh, performing 15 to 30 nuclear stress tests, cardiology fellow run, um, really getting your hands into it. Um, at the same time, we had a huge cath lab volume. So the correlations and the ability to decide the right pathway for the patient uh, was key. And so being entrenched in it, um, they also were able to give us the educational opportunities that come with that high volume. And just for those who are training or just finished training, I'd like to include that when I finished in New York, it was still requiring the 200 hour radionuclide authorization use of course. So we were lucky enough they included that in our training. Um, what made me love nuclear cardiology was the pathophysiology, but it was also the mentorship. So um, here were my two uh, nuclear cardiology mentors when I was at North Shore University Hospital. On the left is Jennifer Morez, who was a former uh, president of ASNIC. And she was uh, there during my residency and early in my fellowship and really talked about the love of imaging and the love of the impact that you can make in a society as well as the individual patient. On the right is Regina Druce, who is one of the most innovative cardiologists I know, who got me interested in clinical research um, and gave opportunities at that point to really learn the, the specialty um, and to see how it correlated with clinical cardiology outside of imaging, which has been a focus of mine as well. It also gave me the opportunity to go to my first ASNIC meeting. So here's 2017 presenting my first ASNIC poster. Um, and also that was the time that I, I got to join the leadership development program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, for those folks who, who don't have a robust educational nuclear focused um, program at their training program, I wanna uh, give a shout out for ASNIC University, which I think is really important, especially, and I'll mention later how how nuclear cardiology has changed from when I was a fellow to now, where, as I mentioned, a lot of our focus was purely on SPECT imaging for perfusion, right? We were doing viability, we were doing MUGA, but it was all within SPECT. Now the education is so much more vast. And we know that every training program isn't able to provide that a high level of training in all the subspecialty areas. And so ASNIC University is a great opportunity for people to learn across the board um, and get expertise in all the areas. And here are just a couple of their programs. So I finished fellowship and I was told by one of my mentors that education doesn't end at the end of your formal training. That once you go into faculty, you have to um, continue your training and your education every day. So in 2008, I moved over to NYU Langone Health in New York City um, as a junior faculty member. And I had two tasks in the job that I took. It was to develop a clinical cardiology practice, uh, both inpatient and outpatient, and it was being attending in the nuclear cardiology laboratory, both at New York University and Bellevue Medical Center. Um, and as academic hospitals, we had the fellows there with us every day. And so getting to both um, practice, but also get to teach throughout. And when I came on board, I was, I was told there will always be a fear of removing the crutch. And by the crutch, I mean, when, when you're interpreting studies, 
when you're seeing patients, uh, there's always someone to call. There's always an attending who's signing the report. Um, and when you become attending at the very beginning, um, there, there's a fear that comes with it. Sure, the normals are normal. The very abnormals are very abnormal for every imaging study, but there's all the stuff in the middle that becomes more problematic. So what you do to deal with this change is you make sure you have people to rely on. So you have your village. And so here, uh, when I started, these are the faculty that were there when I started uh, and came on soon after and, and encourage people to have those folks that they trust internally that they can call to review a case, to review an image, and make sure that um, that, uh, that relationship is bi-directional. As the years continued, and, and I've been at NYU, and I took over as director of the nuclear lab, and got more involved in ASTEC, I started developing people outside who I would call a cases. So here's Prem Soman and Todd Miller, who I met through ASNIC early on in my career, and continue to have a relationship where I'll literally, if there's something that's complicated, I'm not sure how to handle it, I'll call them up, we'll, We'll actually review images um, to make sure that that collaboration occurs, especially as new modalities and new techniques come up and you need to start that momentum to push forward. Now we know that, that it's not just at our own institution, but we all could use more collaboration. Um, about, must be about seven years ago, um, I was asked to get involved in the ischemia trial, which you know, Charmilla mentioned Judy Hockman earlier. So this is uh, uh, Judy Hockman and Dave Merritt's uh, most recent large study, the ischemia trial. I'm not going to go through the results. I just want to go through this part, which all of you know, the enrollment criteria, almost half the patients that were randomized to ischemia came in with nuclear cardiology um, as the imaging modality to get the moderate or greater severe ischemia. Um, and at that time, uh, Leslie Shaw called me and said that they were trying to do more in imaging education. So two more mentors of mine, Dan Berman and Leslie Shaw. Um, Leslie was in charge of the Imaging Coordinating Center, Dan um, running the uh, Nuclear Core Lab. And we're finding that some of the studies that were being submitted for enrollment uh, for ischemia from around the world did not have enough ischemia for randomization. So here, this is from one of the papers, and I just show that 26% you know, of the patients that were enrolled, not randomized, had mild or no ischemia when the core lab looked at the scan. So this was a fantastic opportunity to, to merge my clinical um, experiences, my educational hat, and I love nuclear cardiology. And I had the opportunity to set up through webinars with, with uh, centers around the world to review cases and to talk about discords between core lab reads um, and the site reads, and really to work for improvement in nuclear uh, cardiology reading in other locations. So where am I now? Um, over the years, I've continued my clinical practice. Um, now I'm doing more outpatient than inpatient cardiology, and I'm medical director of our outpatient cardiology center, where we have um, 45 cardiologists who are seeing patients different degrees over eight offices. Um, I've been director of nuclear cardiology here for the last 10 years. And one of my favorite roles is associate program director for the cardiology fellowship, where we're, we're now increasing to 25 fellows um, starting next Friday. Nuclear cardiology has changed a lot, right? When I was a fellow, as I mentioned, it was rest, stress, spect, and, and viability, MUGA. And now things have changed, right? So we've expanded our nuclear cardiology lab with all these different tests and modalities that are performed. And the way to stay current is to continue learning. And I think that's one of the greatest parts of the ASNIC as I've developed clinically as well, is to make sure I have a way to learn new skills. Um, I mentioned momentum before. I remember when we started doing PYP imaging that, um, that uh, it was hard to start doing the first one because there was something that was missing. There was a knowledge that was missing. There was a comfort that was missing, but only by relying on colleagues from other institutions who were doing it, do we start doing the imaging. And now by paying it forward and training others, that's how we continue. Uh, finally, the newest role that I've taken on um, has to do with quality within our health system. And it goes back to my original point of all the nuclear stress tests that are performed, knowing that, um, that here in our health system, which has 22 nuclear cardiology labs, about 80% of the nuclear stress tests take place outside of our academic hospitals in um, office-based imaging labs. And so making sure that the quality is similar across the board. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned uh, when I joined the ASNIC Leadership Development Program, so I wanna get back to it a little bit and um, make sure people are aware in case they're interested in coming and joining here. 
Um, as I could develop this program in 2003, and the idea is that over two year intensive program, we center on three pillars of leadership development. And I put here uh, my partner in crime for the program, Don Edgerton, and to really emphasize that it's a partnership in having a successful program. And we think of the pillars of mentorship, um, governance and leadership skills. For mentorship, when you participate in the program, we set each person up with a senior leader within the ASDA community to serve as a mentor. The goals for that mentorship are different for each person. And we learned this uh, early on. It's not always you know, a research career push or a clinical career push. A mentor it has to be able to focus on the area that the mentee is looking to improve on. So it could be research collaboration. It could be advice, or it could just be career planning, you know, how to run a lab or other components of it and making sure that we fit the person appropriately. For society governance and special projects, what we've done is everybody who joins the program, their first year, they serve on the ASNIC Education Committee, the second year on the ASNIC Health Policy Committee. And then as they finish the program, they get appointed to a three-year term to keep them involved in the organization. And there are many other opportunities that they receive to participate in the annual meeting, uh, to advocate and meet with legislators, uh, to be involved in CME programs, and the list goes on, making sure not to overwhelm people. And the third um, is the development of leadership skills and taking a slant where it's a combination of physician leadership and staff leadership uh, within the society to talk about topics you might not hear as much about, um, but are really important. So taking it a little to the side, right? Talking about intro to advocacy, how to put on national meetings, what it means to have a CME event. And we do this quarterly with a lot of participation from people uh, back and forth at the national meeting, we will be having a get together, kind of a, a think tank discussion, which we're really excited about. So has the program gone and what's been the success of the program? Well, as of June 1st, we have had 109 people participate in the program over the last years. Um, four of our, our previous participants have served as ASNIC president. Uh, of our current executive committee, four of the seven people were part of the leadership development program. Um, and 22 of the participants have have served or are currently serving on the ASIC Board of Directors and the list goes on and on. And we really think it's a, a strong program with tremendous resource allocation from ASNIC to make it success. So for anybody listening to the program who'd be interested in participating, feel free to reach out to me. We'll be opening our next um, recruitment season soon um, and looking forward to working with you. So for both topics, really appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for sharing with us your remarkable journey, love for nuclear cardiology, and how the field has advanced truly from your fellowship years to practice and the importance of having a village while practicing beyond training. I would like uh, to invite everybody to please en enter uh, any questions that you may have for any of our speakers in the chat box. And uh, I would invite my co-moderators, Mrin and Michael, and all the speakers for a question and answer session before we move on to our next talk. Those were excellent, excellent talks. My first question is for Dr. Dorbala, whose talk was phenomenally inspiring and I also definitely took notes. Dr. Dorbala, you touched upon the grant writing process. So just going back to your first grant, I guess you were early career. Did you ever have doubts? Did you ever feel overwhelmed? And you said that you reached out to people. So who did you reach out to? Could you take us through that process? Yeah, an excellent question. Um, so yes, the first grant writing can be very, very challenging. I think this is where the mentors and the rest of the team members with expertise can help. So I reached out to my colleagues here and one of the persons that works with me very closely, uh, Marie, <laughs> Marie and uh, Vasvi knows her. So she is, I cannot uh, write any grant without Mary's input. She's a nuclear medicine physicist who's an expert who served in the NIH grant review committee for uh, 20, 25 years. And she is so knowledgeable and she really can pinpoint to the exact, um, you know, she can look at it from the eyes of a reviewer. And I think that is key, that is very important. The other person I went to, um, to really take help with, this is something I don't say lightly is, uh, I had some questions about my English language skills for grant writing. So I actually had a writer take a look at it 
And to my surprise, what the writer commented on was, your grant is all science and science. It's not touching, touching an emotional chord with me, the reader. So she said, make it more, um, more patient-based, like talk about how your study is going to really improve patients' health. Uh, not talk about you know improving outcomes and survival and all that. She like she just made that tiny tweak from science to making it more like a layperson. What's that? I think those two uh, that was a very important learning point for me. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Dr. Dorbella. Yeah, no, thank you all for uh, for great talks. Those were really wonderful. I think across the board. Um, I guess one question I have, um, I could uh, target it towards Larry. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be in uh, the leadership development program for the past two years. And I think um, I, even over that short period of time, I've witnessed so much evolution under his watch. And I just wondered um, what his vision is for the future of uh, the LDP, especially in light of uh, the emerging multimodality environment with recent chest pain guidelines and how that could um, potentially benefit uh, fellows who are potentially interested in joining? No, thanks, Mike. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think there, there are a couple next steps within the program. I think the, the core components we need to, to keep stable, I think the mentor-mentee relationship, um, the committee involvement will continue to expand and, and learning the governments. Um, what we've, we've started trying to do in some of our group get-togethers as you're aware, is, is focus on collaboration and, and knowing, um, you know, by being in the, the LDP, it's not, you have to say nuclear cardiology is the best for all patients all the time, right? And, and many of our, our members are gonna be, are part of other societies and are gonna be interacting with leadership in other societies too. And there, we have to strive for this mutual respect that should take place for multimodality imaging, for what we talk about patient-centered imaging, that it, it has to be what, um, what's best for the patient. And, and how do you approach that? And how do you approach the conversation when people might only be looking at one modality? Um, and, and that's what, where I think some of the real leadership skills are gonna have to take place, right? And so we're, we're expanding our curriculum and our programming in that area. Um, one, the other thing that we're going to be focusing on more is translating from, from participation in education to helping the LDP members develop a portfolio of speaking and activities. That's been something that we've received feedback to make sure that their involvement in our educational programs um, continues to blossom, especially as they've shown so much dedication to expanding the field. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much for uh, answering all of our uh, questions. Our next speaker is the Dr. Kartikeyan Anand Subramaniam. He's the Director of Nuclear Cardiology and Cardiac Pet Lab at Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital in West Bloomfield, Michigan. He's currently serving as the Program Chair for the ASNIC 2022 Scientific Session and Exhibition. He will be providing us with the most valuable lessons uh, and sessions for trainees and early career attendees at ASNIC 2022. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Anand Subramaniam. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, I'm uh, just going to check and make sure I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, we can. Perfect. So, uh, you know, really uh, a wonderful eye opening session to hear my colleagues uh, and their pathways to uh, leadership roles. So, obviously, privileged to be part of this group. I thought I'll spend a few minutes uh, to, you know, highlight my. Um, personal journey to, uh, into ASNIC and its leadership. Uh, and I hope to bring some, some unique perspective because I'm a foreign graduate. So obviously that brings some unique challenges and perspectives to it. But I think if, if the early career in FITs had to take away one lesson from this particular thing is, is identifying uh, connections, mentors, and well-wishes. I think that's what essentially leads you to the path and that's true for life in general, right? So you want to surround yourself with people who uh, you believe will enhance um, your path as just like you can enhance them. So obviously I came to the US in 1992 as a 
foreign graduate on a J-1 visa, which obviously has significant limitations, um, along with my wife, completed my cardiology, internal medicine cardiology fellowship at Henry Ford and did my advanced echo fellowship at Henry Ford uh, and graduated there. And so when I graduated, uh, one of the challenges I had was I was seeing glimpses of myocardial perfusion imaging, but I was not able to get properly trained in it. And I, I knew the value, but I just couldn't get my foot into uh, getting trained in myocardial perfusion imaging because uh, as many of us know, different institutions handle nuclear imaging in different ways. And uh, our nuclear perfusion imaging was primarily dealt with by radiology. So I just could not get enough exposure. So I graduated with, uh, with a feeling of deficiency in general and practiced as a cardiologist and associate director of the echo lab for about three years and realized that I was missing a significant portion of imaging in general. And so I, I actually left Henry Ford um, and it just so happened a wonderful door opened for me uh, when I joined the Advanced Imaging Fellowship in Nuclear and PET at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute in Canada. And so I would say that my key mentors for nuclear cardiology were Rob Beanlins and Terry Ruddy, who I, you know, I still have phenomenal relationship with and uh, all of us know they run a fantastic program. And it's just my connections there with the, with the fellows, with the faculty, with Rob and Terry, just kind of catapulted me into uh, nuclear cardiology and PET. And uh, the training, uh, and when I started looking for jobs as I finished my training, that was when I joined ASNIC, by the way, to, to, uh, 2002. So I was a little bit late bloomer into ASNIC, finishing all my fellowship and everything. So many of you are already have your foothold in this, which is awesome. So I think finding the right mentor was a key for me in that particular aspect. And, uh, and following that, my chief hired me back, but then I kind of made the decision at that time to tell them that we needed to actually develop more collaboration with radiology so that everyone could get the benefit of nuclear cardiology. So when I came back to Henry Ford, it actually took me eight months of negotiation to break the curtain between cardiology and radiology. I did not read a single nuclear scan for eight months after my imaging fellowship. So it took me such a long time with the leadership of Henry Ford to finally come to a collaborative solution to bring cardiology and radiology together. And I would say for anyone who thinks it's not possible, never say cannot do. I think continuous trying, working uh, towards a, a joint goal is kind of key. And so ever since then, it's been a success all the way through. So we started our first joint nuclear cardiology program to this day, which is flourishing. We share our reading with nuclear medicine the fellows get the benefit for both nuclear medicine and cardiology exposure. And then three years down the line, when we knew that we had a solid relationship with cardiology, I took a sabbatical and went out and did my CT and MR fellowship at the William Beaumont Hospital uh, and came back and restarted the cardiology CT and cardiac MR program, again, combined with radiology. So we further expanded our imaging uh, arena with collaboration with radiology and that helped to launch the imaging fellowship, which I started in 2010. I served as a program director for the advanced imaging fellowship for 11 years and I just stepped down due to numerous other responsibilities. Um, you know, at the same time, the American College of Cardiology has been a very close friend to me. I now have taken over as the governor for the Michigan chapter for the ACC. And that is primarily because I wanted to serve in advocacy quite a bit. That is an area which I clearly did not have much experience and wanted to gain more experience. So when the opportunity presented itself, I did that. Now, ASNIC has always been near and dear to me. And um, many of my colleagues here, uh, including uh, Sharmila, uh, Prem Soman, uh, and a lot of other mentors and friends and colleagues have actually helped me through the leadership path. I, I, I was fortunate to run the board prep course for over five years, be on the board of directors, and now fortunate to join a, a very select group of individuals, uh, many in this panel here in the executive council. So delighted, um, delighted to be part of this. And I would say, um, I think finding the right friends, mentors, connections, networking is key, um, uh, key so that you can actually move ahead in your leadership path. So with that said, I am really excited to present to you a sneak peek for ASNIC 2022. We are all raving to get back in person. We can meet and greet and talk. 
And uh, we hope uh, really all of you will, uh, will encourage your colleagues and friends to attend. This slide is not meant for you to read through all of this, but just to tell you that we have a packed session spanning literally four days for you. So that's the, so you can see that ASNIC actually begins in many ways on Thursday, September, um, to, uh, September 8th. And unique this time is we are offering um, uh, a, a, a variation of the um, town hall of the board prep course we've done for many uh, times. This is called Nuclear Cardiology Foundations and Applications. This is going to be a significant case-based interactive session with the board prep faculty for four hours. And that's actually followed by um, a very cutting edge uh, technological advances in cardiovascular molecular imaging session, which I would definitely ask FITs and early career folks to attend. This is going to feature many things where imaging is going to be um, expanding its applications, including role of the heart and brain in uh, imaging, role of the heart and rheumatological diseases and imaging, a whole body amyloidosis, and a lot of things in store where you can meet academicians uh, uh, giving their talks, uh, how, how research um, was performed in these areas. So something to stimulate all of you. And for the first time also on, uh, for ASNIC, we are offering the hybrid imaging symposium, which really helps to set the foundation for building expertise for people interpreting nuclear cardiology in CT, uh, uh, has how it plays a role in SPEC CT and PET CT. Moaz and his team are leading this effort and this is the first among many, um, many programs which will be offered as part of the hybrid imaging, um, what I would say as a curriculum to develop this kind of competency. Uh, and that is obviously followed by a health and equity session, and then obviously uh, opportunity for you to network in the opening reception and expo. Friday the 9th is again a pact, and we have the uh, famous Varani lecture. Uh, Dr. Dorbala is going to be our Varani lecturer this year. Uh, excited to hear about her uh, experience and uh, research um, in uh, amyloidosis, uh, followed by uh, President's address. Uh, um, as you may know, that uh, Moaz is actually uh, the uh, incoming president who's going to be giving his address, and we're going to hear from Dennis about his uh, presidency year too. Um, and so, I'll, and then span, I'll, I'll go into some of these sessions in details, but uh, you can see that the sessions span into Saturday and into Sunday, and then we have a dedicated following weekend tech session. And I would say, even though these are called tech sessions, this, these sessions uh, span multiple basics, which will be very useful for FITs and early career cardiologists, particularly focusing on technological aspects of nuclear imaging. So this year, uh, obviously, ASNIC 2022 is in person. There is selected live streaming. It is heavily case-based. Um, uh, as, as you know, based on the themes, we are offering multitude of symposia, patient interviews as part of um, sessions, uh, numerous cases from the community as we have asked people to submit cases and we got an overwhelming number of cases submitted, uh, which, which are going to be featured in ASNIC 2022. We have hands-on workshops, uh, thanks to Kathy Flood and Lane Duval and his team for putting these together. The, this is challenging. And I would actually definitely recommend that FITs sign up for these so that they can get their hands wet with PET, SPECT, sarcoid, multimodality imaging cases using different platforms. Uh, and then we have uh, the uh, cases with the ACES in a different format this time, which is called House Full of ACES. And uh, Rupa and her team have put together a phenomenal program. Uh, uh, so you're gonna be delighted to see this. And we're gonna have a lot of interaction in this program with moderators on the floor, um, kind of interacting with the audience and the faculty on this one. We have multimodality imaging sessions, advanced tracks and plenaries like the usual, and Jeopardy is finally back, and Emmanuel Secura and uh, Brian Abbott is going to be doing the Jeopardy uh, sessions, so fun with education is back, and there's a special ticketed opportunity for social interaction and uh, um, at the Disney Epcot, which is being planned as part of your registration too. Uh, I already spoke a little bit about Thursday, the September 8th, so I'm going to uh, jump ahead of this uh, to the September 9th. A couple of important things is that the Young Investigator Awards presentation, again, a very important um, uh, part of ASNIC, 
uh, is to watch our young uh, investigators present their um, research cutting edge. Again, a great way to kind of get excited about research and see what people are doing and your peers are doing. Um, we have two expo breaks where posters will be present and that's a great networking opportunity to meet uh, with colleagues um, so that you can have um, you know, uh, new relationships and new connections to develop on. And particularly on September 9th, I would definitely encourage folks to attend the new uh, quality metrics session. So as an equality metrics document, which is in process is a massive document put together under the leadership of Andrew Einstein and Fadi H with many in this panel, as well as uh, others who have participated in this document. So this is going to be a sneak peek session highlighting every highlighting aspects of the document over an hour. And this is probably going to set the stage for how quality nuclear imaging should be performed across, uh, across the institution. So don't miss this session for September 9th. September 10th, we have plenaries focused on chest pain imaging. You can learn about device infection and inflammation, new multimodality imaging session on allograft vasculopathy and imaging. We have hands-on workshop. And again, we have expo sessions for networking opportunity and the jeopardy. Now don't leave on September 11th because we have a plenary on amyloid and we have two special symposia uh, focusing on women and heart disease put together by um, Viviani and um, uh, Niti. Um, and then all about flow symposium put together by Terry Ruddy and uh, Ron Swartz. So really a lot to learn uh, from ASNIC. I'm truly excited. Um, that we, uh, we're going to be all meeting in person. There's going to be a lot of education, opportunities for networking, hands-on sessions, and some fun. So hope to see you all of, all, all of you there. Um, so register now, come and learn, network with friends, and tweet away. For those of you who are tweet experts, we want you to tweet about ASNIC 2022 as much as you can so that we can get the excitement going. Um, and uh, don't forget to come back on September 17th for the technology sessions, which covers a lot of basic aspects. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Anand Subramaniam, for sharing your personal journey in nuclear cardiology, how to persevere and navigate unique challenges successfully, and for giving us a phenomenal overview of everything that ASNIC 2022 has to offer to FITS and early career physicians. With this, I would again like to invite my co-moderators, Marin and Michael, and all the speakers for our second uh, question and answer session before concluding. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand Subramanian. So one quick question. There's obviously a lot of high yield information that's going to be spread across these four days. Um, so what would be your thoughts on medical students interested in cardiology, um, you know, residents trying to get into cardiology, thinking of research, and also just early uh, fellows, first year, second year fellows attending ASNIC. Yes, um, and uh, honestly speaking, I think uh, there is a lot of networking opportunities uh, where they can meet up, particularly at the Expo Center. One of the things I, I didn't mention, but I'll mention now is we are also going to um, uh, display the cases for the community. So numerous uh, cases from the community where there are residents, uh, some students who have submitted cases, all of them are going to be displayed. Um, we tried our best this year to actually try to create like a town hall networking. But as you can see, given the amount of sessions that we had to incorporate, as well as um, kind of limitations as we are launching a live program after two years of COVID, and we had to look at the business aspect of it. Uh, there were some restrictions from that angle. We couldn't execute that. But my co-chair, uh, Rami Dukey, which whom I have to thank, along with obviously Jane Dunn, um, who, who uh, they are key. I mean, I couldn't have put together this program along with my planning committee, uh, which was an awesome planning committee, along with Rami and uh, Jane. Uh, uh, Rami, who's uh, taking notes for uh, next year, I think uh, one of the key things we want to do is to try to encourage that kind of interaction which you're talking about. What about medical students? What about early career? How do they get to meet with the leadership? Um, I think that's going to happen for sure next year where we're going to potentially have a session where we just have the leaders of ASNIC, you know, including the board members, the council members the, uh, and the leaders just meet with people at different time points without any formal topic 
and open it up for discussion so that you can get that kind of speed dating kind of concept so that we can get them excited uh, uh, and begin that kind of connections, which will lead to better career pathways. But um, for ASNIC 2022, I think uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be open for networking in multiple different ways. We don't have a specific session designed for that, but I would encourage um, uh, you know, any of these early career folks to stop any one of us talk to us. I'm sure all of us would be delighted to talk uh, and we're excited to get all of you involved. Awesome. And the one thing I always noticed is ASNIC has always been very inclusive. So yes. definitely a reflection of that. Thank you. I guess I would just um, ask, so it, the, the schedule is quite packed. So one thing that was always a struggle with, for me when I was um, a trainee and I was at um, you know, a conference like this uh, is to what to pick and when. Are, are folks gonna have access to, uh, to the other sessions at a later time? So if they choose to go to one session, will they be able to, to watch one that they, uh, that they weren't able to attend? Yes, yes. I think that is part of the meeting on demand um, uh, package. Um, you know, I think that will be worked out for sure and you'll get more details about that. Uh, obviously, you will, all, you will have an ASNIC app also with actually keywords which will help you to identify the sessions to actually attend. So we've created keywords so that uh, people can say, well, I want to hear about pets. So it's going to kind of highlight all the pet sessions. So that will be available too. But the uh, MOD program will be available. Many of the sessions that you were not able to be attended, you will be able to see later on. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hey, Karthik, really great talk. So my question is, do you have any incentives for FITs in the, in the Orlando area to attend the meeting without... Um, with complementary registration, for example, to attract the local trainees, medical students to join the meeting? Um, I can't think of anything right off the bat. I don't know if Kathy is there. I'll probably throw it to, on to Kathy Flood for that particular uh, comment. Kathy, any comments on that for uh, Sharmila? So I'm sorry, Sharmila, you, you were asking if it, it was complimentary for local fellows? Could we, could we encourage local trainees, fellows, medical students to come to ASNIC and could we offer some kind of complimentary registration for Orlando area trainees, for example? Is that an option? We can, we can definitely market directly to them and we can cr create some kind of unique incentive that would get them to the meeting. We can definitely look at that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. So with that, I would really like to thank all the speakers and moderators for such a phenomenal session. And to all of you attending uh, this inaugural webinar as a part of the webinar series focused on early career physicians and FITS. Uh, this webinar will be made available at the ASNIC educational platform and through social media. Uh, some key deadline announcements, uh, the application deadline for the future leaders program has been extended to June 27, and the early registration rates for ASNIC 2022 meeting will be ending on June 30th. So please take advantage of those opportunities. With that, please stay tuned and visit the ASNIC website for the latest news and wide selection of educational resources. Thank you all for joining.